Beep boop. Okay. Right. Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. So before we actually have our presentation for tonight, um, Tom Burleson is going to share about the bear hunt coming up on April 1st. So I'm going to turn it over to him, All right. meaning I'm literally going to turn it over to him <laughs> physically. Da, 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 da. Can you understand slides for me? Yes, I will. All right. Uh, we need to have something to jumpstart and get back into the observing business. And so I thought we'd have a visual bear hunt. I had originally planned this for uh, February, March, April of 2019, but we've pl put it off a couple of years now for the, uh, for the COVID. This year, we're gonna have it. April 1st, 2020, it is not an April Fool's joke. If we have inclement weather, depending on how bad it is, if it's gonna be really bad, we'll probably put it off for a month. If it's just gonna be bad on Friday night, we'll put it off one night and we'll have it Saturday night. But that's so, so that's the plan. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, fun night. Emphasis on fun. <laughs> People who have not been looking at faint fuzzies and have heard about the Messier Marathon and those kind of things, this is an opportunity to get your toe in the water. So we've got a short list of faint objects, which we're calling bears, in and around the Big Dipper. And there will be maps, things to look at, there will be refreshments. And there will be certificates for the participants afterwards. Next slide. Okay, this is the list. You notice most of them are Messier objects. There's some double stars down there at the bottom. And at the very bottom, there's the Cheshire Galaxies. That is a special target. It is very dim. At the time I originally made the list, I thought we would have the 21 inch operational. And you might be able to see this with the operational 21 inch may not be able to see it with any of the telescopes that we have on board, but that's a, that's a special target south of the bull. All right, next slide. This is what the sky will look like that night with the Ursa Major bear upside down. And when I say south of the bowl, that's gonna be things that are up from the bowl. So north is down, south is up around the Ursa Major at that time of night. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a map of the, of the items we're gonna be looking for. They're red dots. Red dots up in the upper right-hand corner, M81, M82, they're galaxies. Uh, M40 is a galaxy. There's some nebula in there. Uh, there's Alcor and Mizar. They're about halfway down on the left-hand side. More galaxies underneath. And over in the lower right corner is a Sloan Digital Survey object. <laughs> Excuse me, a Sloan digital survey object. That is the Cheshire Galaxy. Next slide. It's aimed at members. And I don't want to discourage the general public, but I don't think they will enjoy it very much. Uh, the fun is going to be you finding, searching for, and finding and recognizing fake fuzzy object on the Messier list. Uh, a general, general observer will come over and look in the eyepiece and see something fuzzy. And then hear you being excited about it. And hear it. So, meh. Yeah, all right. Small scope, like a 60 or a 70 millimeter, probably are going to disappoint. If you don't have anything larger, you should still come out because the society has larger telescopes that you can pull out and set on the grass and use for that evening. So if you're thinking, oh, I can't participate because my scope is too small, don't let that stop you. Come on out and we'll set up on a bigger scope. Next slide. Okay, there will be certificates. There will be certificates in two categories, digital astronomers and real astronomers. <laughs> yep, real astronomers don't use those motorized things. There will be three levels of achievement. Those who found all of the objects, those who found some of the objects, and those who had a good time. Uh, we'll call this the gold level, the silver level, and the tapioca pudding level. <laughs> There'll be two other certificates awarded, one for congeniality and one for, one for the nicest telescope. So there's always a chance for you to win a certificate. Next slide. It's going to be a fun bear hunt. I hope to see all of you out there. Uh, next slide, I think it's a stop. Go, go one more. That's the Cheshire group of galaxies. That's a Hubble photograph of the area. That's, that's undoctored. That's what it really looks like. Yes. 
There's, a, there's some kind of a galaxy way behind those, that small group there with the two big galaxies and a couple more smaller ones. That's the Cheshire, and that's in Ursa Major, but I doubt if any of the scopes that we have will be able to see it. We'll try. We'll see. All right, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> see you there. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Okay, let me get this figured out real quick. Just make sure it looks good. Thank you, Jared, gamma man. You're good. Yeah, I guess that's good. Cool. So give me one second. Let me pull over to my presentation for tonight. Close that. All right. So, so lighting good in here? Is that good? Does that look good? Turn it down a little bit. Okay. Um, before we get started, I did want to mention one thing. Um, we're actually going to be having a, an auction coming up on the May meeting. Um, the May meeting, as you may or may not know, is the annual meeting. So that is when we elect officers. There are, I believe, three officers up for re-election or for up for election. Three or four. Three or four. Um, and we're going to be having a silent auction of telescopes, eyepieces, and assorted random astronomy and some camera parts, surprisingly. Um, this will be something that's open to members, and we'll be talking a little bit more about it. We'll have more official updates as we go through. Um, but for right now, don't worry too much about it. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, but tonight, we're going to be talking about Black History Month and the astronomers that helped found it. Now, I, I uh, want to thank, first off, uh, Jenna Crook for allowing me to use portions of her presentation. Um, I've added on a little bit of my own style, as I usually seem to do. And uh, this will be a, a fairly short presentation because it's actually very pretty outside. So if anybody wants to actually go out and do observing, this would be the night to do so. So the first guy I want to talk about is a man named ben, uh, Benjamin Banneker. So he was born in 1731, died 1806. Um, he was born to Mary Banneker and Robert. Robert had no last name. He was, um, he was a slave taken from Africa and he was a member of the Dogon people. So I did a little research on them as well. And they have deeply rooted uh, traditions of that of astronomy. So a lot of these, um, a lot of his interest in astronomy was rooted from his ro uh, Robert from his from his tribe. Um, Benjamin, though, was self-taught. He used the uh, the local Ellicott family. They were essentially a well-to-do Quaker family. Um, believed in in uh, ab uh, abolitionists, uh, they were abolitionists and they uh, assisted him in learning about um, all sorts of different things. They had a, a huge library of, of books that he took, um, uh, he borrowed to take a look at. So he was an inventor, a mathematician and an astronomer. Um, he lived way out in the boonies of Maryland. Uh, Oella, Maryland is, is at that time in the 1700s was not a very well-known area. And he had never seen a clock before. Um, there was a local, um, uh, there was one pocket watch in that, in that entire town. And using that pocket watch as a design, he was able to construct a wooden clock, a stand-up clock out of wood entirely. The whole thing, including the gears and all of the mechanisms inside of it, entirely out of wood. Um, a little bit later into his life, and he was in his uh, 20s, 30s, he actually assisted in doing the very first survey of the DC boundaries um, using stars. Um, he helped with, uh, once again with the Ellicott family, they, uh, they commissioned him to assist with that. And uh, he also worked with Thomas Jefferson, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and he, and the, his thing that was most well known was his almanacs from 1792 to 1797. Now, anybody that saw the uh, Amasa Holcomb presentation, I believe that was last month, um, very similar backstory um, of just kind of a guy doing almanacs the way that he wanted to do them. Uh, he had he was very popular. These were very popular almanacs and very well received. And, um, I read some of the ye olde uh, criticism or not criticisms, but uh, reviews of it, and all of them were very, very, uh, very high for the time. Um, as I've stated before, he was an avid abolitionist. He wrote with Thomas Jefferson to unfortunately no avail. Um, Thomas Jefferson, as you may well know, was a slave owner and uh, was not moved by his words. Now I did, uh, Rod actually asked a question that I totally missed and this was for you, Tom. Um, is there, where can he get the list for the objects for the bear hunt? 
I guess he's going to pre-study. Rod, what do you want for it? What do you want for it, Rod? Okay, yeah. We'll put it in the newsletter. How about that, Rod? Is that okay? Yes, no, maybe so. Anyway, I just noticed that he had said that. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, the next person I want to talk about is Dr. Walter McAfee. Now, that we've gone forward a couple of centuries because there wasn't too many that I could find um, in between. He grew up in Marshall, Texas. Um, Alma maters was Wiley College, Ohio State University, and Cornell University. So he worked on Project Diana. Now, this is a very important uh, achievement. Basically, it proved that it was feasible for us to be able to physically send signals to the moon and back. It takes about 2.5 seconds for a radio signal to reach the moon and come back. McAfee, his entire job during this process was to provide the, uh, the mathematical calculations to be able to determine exactly when it comes back that it is in fact the same um, radio signal that they sent. Um, this was the birth of radar astronomy and, and, and it proved that we could actually penetrate the ionosphere. Now, uh, a little bit after Project Diana in 1949, he got his doctorate in physics under Hans Beth. And if you don't uh, know that name, he worked heavily on the Manhattan Project. He worked, uh, McAfee's, uh, Dr. McAfee's PhD was on nuclear collisions, which makes sense with who he worked for. Worked for. So the ionosphere, in case uh, anybody that doesn't know, the ionosphere is about 30 to 600 miles in altitude, and it's the inner edge of the magnetosphere for the planet uh, Earth, if you haven't heard of it before. It is, uh, basically it was discovered that high frequency radio waves bounce off of it anywhere from three to 300 megahertz. Um, they were sending much powerful, much, much more powerful things to be able to actually send it beyond um, to the moon. Um, and here's a photo of that. So this is a uh, Project Diana on the right. That is a photo of the, uh, the highly modified SCR-271 radar. Um, that's from World War II. It was a 3,000 watt, 111.5 uh, megahertz signal and quarter uh, second pulses. And that graph right there is the actual graph that they used for um, that proved the test. So the big, uh, this big high mark right here is the original uh, send from the radio signal. And then 200, uh, it's about, it's a little difficult to read because it's uh, not not the highest quality, but it's about that's about as far as the moon is. It's about two hundred sixty thousand miles away, and that is the return of of that signal just a few seconds later. Um, now, obviously, it is it is significantly lower because of all of the energy that it lost in that transfer, but it proved that we were able to actually bounce things off the moon. So we've been this this really opened up a whole lot for the future of uh, radar astronomy. And uh, honestly, just uh, any radio telescope technology in the future as well. Amateur radio, some amateur radio operators actually bounce signals off the moon. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they do. E M E Earth Moon Earth. I am not a. Uh, I am not. I have not joined that cult yet. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe later, maybe later, you guys can in, in, induct me. Now, I do have a very short video um, about this. It was a little propaganda video that I found on the internet. And if anyone's seen my history video, uh, my history presentation before, I love me some propaganda stuff. So, but this was a pretty cool little video I found. Um, it's not very high definition though, unfortunately. <laughs> The vivid imaginations of H.G. Wells and Buck Rogers never cooked up a more fantastic experience than the Army engineers at their laboratory in Belmar, New Jersey. Banks of instrument panels control a radar installation that gives man his first actual contact with the moon. An amazing round trip of over 477,000 miles. Ready to shoot the moon. The radar antenna is pointed directly at Luna, and the thrill of a lifetime is in the making. Three, two and a half second trips up and back. If you're ready for another trip to the moon, let's go. with a 180 cycle note, just about like your home radio. It opens up unlimited possibilities for interstellar experiments, according to Colonel DeWitt, 
who supervised the project. Calculations showed that radar equipment could be put together which would reach the moon and return. If one allows the imagination free reign, many future possibilities appear. Spaceships carrying passengers of thousands of miles per hour can be controlled and communication established with their passengers. For we now know that the Earth's atmosphere can be penetrated. I found that was a Hyde Park accent there. <laughs> yes, very much. Um, very, very FDR. Very FDR. Very FDR. Um, that was Colonel DeWitt. He was in charge of Project Diana. And of course, you'll notice that um, uh, I've just lost my mind. Oh my God. McAfee. God, I'm so sorry. Uh, Dr. McAfee was not mentioned even once during the video, which was, of course, common for the time. Um, and this is what it looks like today. It is actually maintained by the Ocean Monmouth Amateur Radio Club. And I found their little, I found their little logo and I put it on there. Um, and McAfee has a quote there that I found online. I computed a radar cross section of the moon, a radar coverage pattern and the distance to the moon. So they could tell me how big the signal would be when it returned. So basically what I said, he mathematically was able to figure out that if they got a signal back that it was in fact the one that they sent to the moon. And in that video, I really wanted to, to show was the was you could hear the physical um, radio transmission as it comes back. Well, yes, Tom. Same thing. One of the reasons they needed calculations like this was since the radar couldn't be pointed up, it would be pointed horizontally. They had to do it as the moon was coming up. Yeah. In the east, so they they were they were pulsing to see what was out there and what other what other stuff they were getting radar returns back from, and then the moon behind that. I'm in a room full of people that know a lot more about radio tech technology than I do. Yeah. Well, remember, this is a it was a uh, kind of a hodgepodge together piece of machinery from World War II, but it wasn't too far afterwards. Um, I like that little video. Though. I found that uh, earlier on. Our next guy, um, this is Dr. George Carruthers. Um, he was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, his, fa uh, his father was a civil engineer with the U.S. Army Corps, uh, Air Corps. And uh, he, everything I found online just was was gushing about uh, the, how he encouraged the, a love for science and astronomy in his son. Um, he perfected the far ultraviolet camera slash spectrograph for the vacuum of space. He basically just made it. So it was actually capable of being used on the moon. And he found proof of molecular hydrogen in interstellar space. Now, prior to this, this had already been theorized, but he was the very first person to ever find it. Now, these are some photos from the far ultraviolet camera. Um, on the right, the far right, that is the actual, that is a leftover one in a, uh, I believe that is in the Smithsonian. Um, and as it says right there, the one on the left is the sun's UV light reflected off of Earth from the moon. And then there's the large Magellanic cloud UV light. So those were a few of it. I think it was about 150 or so frames of footage captured with this that were brought back um, on tapes, back in reels, back to, uh, back to Earth from Apollo 16. And then there was the Skylab follow-up. So there was actually a backup telescope. This one was modified and was used on Skylab 4 on the Apollo telescope mount. Um, this one was used for uh, Comet Kohotek. Uh, this, I obviously am not old enough to remember this, but it was supposed to be the comet of the century. And it was a massive letdown because it basically broke apart because this was, a, uh, many astronomers at the time or later on found out that this was probably its very first trip to the inner solar system. So it broke up very quickly. And it was also the very first comet ever viewed by crewed spacecraft, two of them, in fact, Skylab 2 and Soyuz 13 both looked at this comet. And I found a little short video about the comet too that I wanted to share for, for context. This was, by the way, this was prior to it. So they make it sound like it's gonna be super exciting, which I thought was funny. Oh, that's really quiet. Hold up. It wasn't that quiet earlier. You don't, you don't remember it? Uh, Jared, help me. I, I'm, I'm bad at technology. There may be noise. There will be noise, yes. This slider is a little scratchy sometimes. This is the last video, so I just need to do it a little bit longer. Try it. Try it. Yes. No, I can't hear it. 
There we go. Okay, cool. Thomas Kahuzak is on his way. Visible between mid November and late January, it will eventually be as bright or brighter than the famous comedy comet of 1910. When Kahuzak reaches its closest point to the sun on December 28th, it will have completed a journey that began about 2 million years ago. Four NASA spacecraft, sounding rockets, balloons, Skylab, ground based observatories, and telescope carrying aircraft like this will team up to form the most comprehensive comet watch ever planned. Astronomers are eager to determine the elements that make up the Luzek, elements that should tell us more about the nature and origin of the sun and other planets. Now, it did do that. It just wasn't very bright. And, you know, for the general public, they only want things to be pretty, right? right. Um, it was a very important scientific advancement. Hi, Jared. Bye, Jared. Um, it was a very important scientific advancement, but unfortunately for the general public, they uh, kind of didn't care because it wasn't very pretty. And then there's Dr. Uh, Bestry. Um, he was born in New York City. He grew up in Fort Collins, Colorado. So he's, a, he's currently a professor of astronomy at University of California, Berkeley. And he's well known for his study on T Tauri stars, which I actually got to learn a whole lot about for this presentation. I'd never even heard of them before. Um, he also discovered the very first young brown dwarf in 1995 using something called a lithium test. Um, and we'll cover that in just a minute. So first off, T Tauri stars, if you couldn't take a guess, guess what, they're in Taurus. Um, I've actually included a little bitty picture there. That's exactly where they are. They're, uh, uh, I think the closest star is Sigma in Taurus. Um, it is less than 10 million years old and these are pre-main sequence stars. So the youngest F, G, K, and M stars. And since, once again, these are brown dwarfs, failed stars, they are powered by gravitational energy, star contraction rather than fusion. And T Tauri, this is the actual star itself that they were talking about. And this little fuzzy spot on the right, that's NGC 1555. And I'm sure Doug would be able to tell me exactly what the official name of that one is, but I do not know it off the top of my head. And then there's brown dwarfs. As I said earlier, these are extreme, uh, failed stars. Um, they can have planets, but it's an extremely rare thing, and it's very difficult for them to have any habitab habitability zone whatsoever. It's extremely narrow. Um, approximately with current our current research that we know today, in 10 years, this will probably be wrong, um, or maybe even in a couple of weeks with James Webb, who knows. Um, right now, it's one to six brown dwarfs to star ratio. So for every six stars, there's one brown dwarf. And I included a couple of pictures here. Um, this is HH1165 with a jet, this big line of, uh, of uh, materials being launched from the brown dwarf Myrit 1701117. Um, astronomers are really great at naming things, aren't they? Great in data analysis. Um, and that's in the constellation Orion. And the photo on the far right, that is how many brown dwarfs there are within 65 light years of the sun, um, which is actually quite a few. Um, so they're pretty, they're, they're not as rare as once thought. Um, it did take a very long time for anybody to even be able to find them. The first one was found, I believe, in the very late 1980s. Um, oh, and what I wanted to mention uh, for the young uh, brown dwarfs. So they use something called the lithium test because lithium uh, basically once the brown dwarf gets hot enough and goes into its full form of a brown dwarf still being a failed star. Um, lithium is actually, it's uh, below the boil, uh, essentially it, uh, gets broken down after a certain point. It's like, I believe it was like 1.5 million Kelvin or something like that. Below that, um, lithium shows up. So those are early, uh, the earliest of brown dwarfs still have that lithium present. Otherwise, they do not, um, but they, they, they grow out of it. They're, they're too cool for it. And then, of course, I couldn't have a presentation on astronomers and black history without mentioning Neil deGrasse Tyson. He was born in 1958. He's the same age as my parents. That's weird. I never thought of that. Um, he's the director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City for over 25 years. He's been doing it since literally I was born. Um, he, he's, he's written and been featured in so many books, magazines, New York uh, articles, sorts, all sorts of things. But of course, he is most notably well known for, uh, for the Cosmos, a space time odyssey, his, uh, basically his love letter to Carl, Carl Sagan. Um, if you did not know, uh, Carl Sagan was his mentor while he was in school. Um, and he had a massive impact on uh, Dr. Tyson and wanting to be able to actually um, do what he, what, what he can. In 2015, he was awarded a public welfare medal 
for his extraordinary role in, exci in exciting the public about the wonders of science. And I believe that was right after Cosmos came out. Now, as I said, this is not a terribly long presentation, but I did want to end on just a lovely quote that I found from him that representation really does matter. And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson said in a quote, I'd never before in my life seen an interview with a black person on television for expertise that had nothing to do with being black. And at that point, I realized that one of the last stereotypes that prevailed among people who carry such stereotypes is that sort of black people are somehow dumb. I wondered maybe that's a way to undermine this sort of this stereotype that's prevailed about who's smart and who's dumb. I said to myself, I just have to be visible or others like me in that situation. That would have a greater force on society than anything else I could imagine. And that was after um, he was interviewed in 1989 um, on a local Fox channel on uh, solar pulse, like there was a pulse coming from the sun. Um, and it was the first time that he had really uh, seen that before. So I think that it's very important for this, uh, for representation to matter for these types of things. Um, and Dr. Tyson has done a fantastic job in, in being a good representation um, for minorities out there. Now, as I said, this is a very, this is a very short presentation, um, but did anybody have any questions about what I've talked about so far? Go on. No? Okay. Anybody on the... Uh... Can you guys hear me? It's not showing up that... Uh... Is, it, is it picking up audio? Oh, God. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, the, green, the green square was not, uh, was not on for mine, so I was a little worried about that. Well, um, that is all I, I had for you. I wanted to give a special thanks to Jenna Crook um, for the use of her materials and for the information that she uh, so gladly gave, gave to me. And hopefully we can go take a look outside because it is absolutely gorgeous if anybody hasn't taken a look yet. It is a really good scene night in my opinion. Um, and with that, I, I don't have anything else I would like to share. Does anybody, uh, was there any questions in the... Um, the Zoom. I could not think of a word to save my life. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have was, another one for if, if they don't know already, we're having planetary insurance. Yes, of course. I, the up yeah, we, we are back. VBOS is back, um, if you couldn't tell from me being here. Um, so Saturday night at 7.30, we have uh, planetarium shows once again every Saturday night at 7.30. Um, what, is the, what is the one tomorrow? Jenna is doing her magic carpet. Uh, She'll be using the projector, using the, ship, yeah. the star projector. Oh, okay. Okay. It takes it back in time and around the seasons and all that. Okay, so it's going to be a look through time with astronomy with Jenna Crook tomorrow. And hey, surprise, surprise, I gave some a uh, little bit of advertising for her for that. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, everyone, um, for listening. I hope that you enjoyed that. Um, I, I've been Michael Buford, and I hope that you've enjoyed that. I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> thank you. I know, I know it was, it was, I know it was short. It looked really nice outside, so I didn't want to. I, I wanted to speed it up a little bit. Um, did anybody actually want to like bring out a telescope tonight, or? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yes, there is a little bit of interest among the people up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll definitely um, remember. Remember what's yeah, test drive. That's definitely a good idea, Eric. Um, so we're gonna go take a look at some of the scopes that we have for um, that'll be auctioned off in the next couple of months. Remember, that's at the May meeting. We're not gonna have a presentation. We're going to have the silent auction instead. Um, and that is something that's open to anyone that wants to come um, for who wants to sell their things. However, VBUS will be taking a, a small a small percentage. Um, those the spine details have not been released yet, so I will get back with you on that with Jeff. Um, we'll have an official announcement for that. But a reminder about the nomination committee. Nominating committee. Yes, there is a nomination committee. Who is in charge of that this year? Anybody remember? Uh, Jenna. Jenna is one of Jenna's, Jenna's on it. Sure. I think Jenna is chairing it. 
Where are the minutes when you need them? Where's Chris at? Are you on that? No. Oh. But anyway, Jenna is. Yeah. If you're interested in being an officer. Yeah, if you're interested in being an officer, I mean. Don't step back. <laughs> if you're interested in being an officer, please email any of us. Um, our emails are available on the website. And with that, that's all I've got for you. So see you later, everybody. How do I stop the recording like that? Oh.